Hello, I'm Logan Boswell, County Extension Agent in Brewster and Jeff Davis Counties, and this is Bruce Carpenter, our District Livestock Specialist for District 6, located in Fort Stockton. Uh, today we're going to talk briefly about poison plants and management of livestock around poisonous plants. There's a little over 100 known poisonous plants in the state of Texas, and at various times they can be a problem to livestock producers. Uh, this is July of 2015 and at this time this year we've had more rain than normal in this part of the world and uh, so far we haven't had very many problems with poisonous plants and probably there's more we probably have more growth of poisonous plants this year than at normal times but one of the big reasons why we haven't had a very big problem with them this year is that we have had plenty of moisture and the grasses have come out and are growing already and the normal forage plants that livestock usually consume are in plenty supply so they don't have to resort to go into eating uh, secondary plants so we haven't had that big a problem with them this year uh, but there, there are a lot of them out here, especially in our area. We have numerous poisonous plants that can cause problems. We have loco, we have garbanceo, we have senecio, we have twin leaf senna, we have emery peavine, we have uh, oh, uh, Johnson grass can be a problem at times uh, in certain situations. Uh, also careless weed and Kosha in growing in pens where there's a lot of uh, accumulated uh, manure and stuff, you can get nitrate accumulation and you can have nitrate poisoning in those instances. And those are probably the probably the biggest uh, potential danger this year that we have because uh, somebody might pin something in some pens where uh, there's a lot of standing either Johnson grass or uh, kosher or careless weed and it uh, has a chance, the potential to have uh, high nitrate accumulation in that, air, that instance. Uh, some of the ways to avoid uh, having animals be poisoned by plants, uh, number one would be to buy native uh, livestock to your area. It, especially out in West Texas, it seems like our native cattle seem to uh, be uh, better suited to grazing or more used to grazing the plants we have in this area and tend to avoid the poisonous plants more than those brought in from somewhere else. Uh, the other big thing on avoiding uh, loss is to never turn livestock in where you know there's poisonous plants when they're really hungry. Always try to make sure if you do have to turn them in somewhere where there are some poisonous plants, make sure they're full before you turn them out there. And uh, that tends to help keep them from uh, just eating the first thing they come to and becoming poisoned. Uh, the third thing is to manage, uh, probably, and probably the most important thing, is good uh, range management practices, keeping your rangelands healthy and in good shape and having a plentiful forage supply so that they don't have to uh, eat everything that's green and growing out there. And that's usually we, when we get in the most trouble in this area is uh, when there's very little other forage available uh, and the poisonous plants are what is green and growing at that time. And uh, we usually get in the biggest wrecks in the late spring before everything greens up and the poisonous plants are the only thing that's kind of green and growing and uh, that's generally when we get in the biggest problem. Kind of looking at the big picture when we talk about poisonous plants, there's lots and lots of plants that are potentially poisonous. Fortunately, most by far the majority of those plants are what we would call non-palatable to livestock. In addition to being poisonous, they also taste bad. We think about how plants cope with gra grazing herbivory, whether it's a grasshopper or a cow or a jackrabbit or whatever it might be, herbivore, uh, you know, they have several ways, one of which is to produce some sort of toxin that either makes the animal sick 
A lot of ways they do that, they just kind of make the animal sick and hopefully the animal learns not to eat the plant. Some of them will kill animals outright, um, so we need to know some about that. Uh, but by far the majority of them are in addition to maybe being toxic, either sick, sick or you know, sudden death kind of plants, which are very few of those really. Uh, uh, they just taste bad, most of them, which is a good thing. So I guess the first thing, we were talking a little bit about grazing behavior yesterday. If you've got cattle that you know are eating plants that taste bad, that are not desirable forage, you might have a problem there. And a lot of times it's not a quantity thing. It's a quality thing, like Logan said, in the winter, you get some cold winters some in some of this country, and the grass does go dormant. And sometimes it's only the green sort of annual weeds, local being a prime example that come in and, and give them something green. So again, supplementation at the right time of the year and things can help. A really good reference for you if you wanna know uh, the toxic plants in your area is this uh, publication that's put out by the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. And it is uh, publication B6106. You can get it online at the Texas AgriLife Bookstore uh, go on that site and uh, type in toxic plants and it'll lead you to this publication. There's some real good features in this book. Uh, like you said earlier, it's got more than one picture of each. It's got usually three or four pictures of each uh, species of poisonous plant. It's got a map as to the areas that that plant occurs and, and where it might where you might have problems with. And in the very back of the book, it's got a neat little chart that lists all the different symptoms livestock can have. And then it lists across the top the, all of the plants that are poisonous. And you can go down through here and see the checklist. If it has a check, it means it could cause those symptoms. If it has a little star, it means that that's the most uh, common symptom that the plant that animals would have. We tried to make this book friendly for ranchers, easy to read. Each plant only has two pages. One page is a picture, the other is a description. So the description always starts out with a description of the plant, what it looks like. The distribution and habitat, again, we mentioned one that might only grow down in draws, others may only grow up on the mountain. Uh, others may grow everywhere. But distribution and habitat, if we know the toxic agent through experimental work, we will list what that is. Many of these plants, we just don't know what the toxic agent is. And we have signs of livestock poisoning listed, which would probably come off that key or hopefully correspond somewhat with the key. And then if we have any recommended management strategies for control, integrated management strategies, they don't always have to be chemical. In fact, most of them on rangelands often are not because the plants don't grow in large, large populations. They're here and they're there. And so management strategies are often an integrated approach where we use grazing management, nutrition, spraying when appropriate, and that kind of thing. All right, so this, this plant again is Cultura Cunyiza, just one that really doesn't give us much trouble. There is some reports over the decades and years of specific instances where this plant has poisoned animals, but uh, if you're trying to identify it, that's kind of an atypical specimen there. It's only about eight inches tall, maybe. Typically, they'd be up taller than your knee, kind of growing in a spike kind of formation. It's got very sticky leaves as well. If you feel of it, it they're sticky and gummy. And goat head is one that, you know, cattle really don't eat it much of it because it doesn't taste good. It's, it, it grows very close to the ground, so cattle have a hard time eating that close to the ground. But sheep and goats, can eat a lot closer to the ground and they will get on that from time to time and it, it will cause what we referred to earlier as photosensitivity of the secondary kind. Got one here we for, referred to a minute ago, silver leaf nightshade or purple light nightshade. Silver because of the leaves, purple because of the flowers. Some of these flowers in some species are actually white, but the vast majority of them are purple. We talked about the seeds being the most toxic part of that. These seeds are just little round pods, and that's probably the worst part. Again, very, very fortunate that this plant is not palatable to livestock because there's a lot of it around, but they just won't seek it out and eat it. It's got stickers, thorns on the stem 
uh, that helps as well. Again, as we mentioned, about the only time you're going to have trouble with this is if you pin cattle up on it, on it inside a corral or something overnight, or if you spray it with a 2,4-D type product and it causes those leaves to become more palatable because of what the chemical does. So anytime you spray a herbicide on weeds, uh, particularly if you know they're toxic, uh, you should wait until those leaves have become dried out and desiccated. It usually takes about a week or so. A couple of our uh, weeds that we have in this area that are probably caused the most problems over the most years would be, uh, one would be loco. It's a stragulus melismus or woolly loco. It's a plant that uh, comes up, it's a perennial plant. It comes up in the fall and it really, uh, if we have enough fall moisture and winter moisture, it'll really uh, blossom out and, and get a lot bigger in the spring and late spring and if it's a real dry bad year uh, and the livestock don't have anything else green to eat sometimes they'll get on uh, loco and uh, and once they do get on it it's a very addictive plant it's uh, it, it uh, has something in it that addicts it the the main poison that uh, it has in it is swansonine that causes the problems and uh, they'll it does take quite a bit of it. They have to eat, I think, like 90% of the body weight for it to kill them. But uh, they'll start showing symptoms way before that. They'll, uh, you know, be kind of listless. They'll uh, start looking for, uh, just looking for the loco to eat. Uh, they kind of have a wild look in their eye, be kind of unmanageable if you have to pin them and stuff. Uh, so that's uh, one of the big problems with loco. Another plant that's really closely kin to it is called Garbanceo, and it's an annual plant. It's a, a stragglers wootenii, I believe, and uh, it has kind of the same growth habit as woolly loco, except it uh, is an annual plant, and it just comes up in the fall and grows through the spring, and pretty much it's all gone by the middle of May or 1st of June. It's all dried up and kind of blown away by then. But uh, once again, it has pretty much the same symptoms as loco, and uh, you can, uh, and livestock will kind of eat it in the same situations.